Was Walt Disney a Nazi? More on that in a moment. Hey everyone out there, I'm Dan, aka The Comic Concierge, and this is one of my history through comic book videos where I look at a moment in history through the lens of a comic book. And today's topic is all about Walt Disney and the company he founded. Now, when we think of Walt Disney today, we think of the pinnacle of family-friendly entertainment. Whether it be a theme park or a movie, it's a place you go to if you want to have fun for all ages. Now, because of that, it makes them the perfect fodder for satirists like Wish Kowalski in his book, Three Fingers, that tells a very similar story about Dizzy Walters and Ricky the Rat and their rise to fame. Despite being a work of fiction, it, it does come from an element of reality. Like all good satire, there is a level of truth to what it's portraying. And it's a truth that clearly goes against that image Disney has worked generations to forge. So let's take a look at that comic and what inspired it. As mentioned, Three Fingers is written and drawn by Rich Kolowski and published by Top Shelf Books and tells the story of Dizzy Walters and Recky Rat in a Ken Burns documentary tale, complete with talking heads and archival photos. This book takes place in a world where toons and humans exist together. Imagine Roger Rabbit, but a bit darker, where toons are considered low-class citizens and are live in neighborhoods like Toonsville. This is where Dizzy first encounters Ricky the Rat playing the piano in a CD nightclub in a way that lit up the room. He was so enamored with what he heard, he began a partnership with Ricky to set off to make movies in the early days of Hollywood. Now, Dizzy and Ricky quickly found success, but with that success came controversy. See, other tunes tried to follow in Ricky's footsteps, but were not so lucky. It led a lot of people to speculate about why was it that Ricky was being successful and these other tunes weren't. It led to this theory of the ritual. Was the ritual? Well, it wasn't certain. Different people had different theories, and each theory had one thing in common. It was dark and twisted, and that speculation led a lot of tunes to make some decisions that would scar them for the rest of their lives, both physically and mentally. It gets into fame and the demons that come with it. It showcased that maybe these lives that we were seeing on screen from both people like Ricky the Rat and other tunes were not the entire story. You may be asking, how does what sounds like a very static story work in the comic format? There are a number of answers to that, one of the biggest being Ritz Kolowski's cartooning. Prior to this comic, he spent many years in the world of animation, and you can tell. This book has a major cinematic feel. The way the talking heads are framed and the acting that goes into them makes you fall directly into the book's atmosphere and forget not only are you reading a comic, but what you're reading is actually not real. When Ricky is speaking, for example, the room is so filled with cigarette smoke and dark shadows, it is as if you can smell the upholstery on the chair. Using the 4 3 design of the book was a smart move, too. You tend to see a succession of six individual panels that keep the pacing moving, so despite being a book that is heavily dependent upon dialogue, you never notice it. Another reason this works is because the caricatures of these people in tunes are just simply disturbing. Corn Horn Armless is one of my personal favorites. Never did I think I'd see a rooster ravaged by old age, but seeing it is still haunting my dreams to this day. This is a case of small details leading to great success. Case in point, the use of archival photos. These archival photos were rendered in a way where you start to see this reality established. It's a lot harder to put cartoons and humans in the same world on the page of a comic book. It's one thing if you're watching a movie and you can see the juxtaposition of cartoons and humans and how they mesh together. This had to make them seem one in the same. This is a balancing act that goes into each and every page where he's able to find a way to make it feel like everyone exists in the same plane, in the same universe. Those photos help that because they, they feel familiar. They do feel like photos you would see in a documentary like this. It doesn't seem outlandish to see this rat and human in the same world. And that's extremely important because if you don't believe they exist together, nothing else matters. This is doing more than lampooning the family-friendly image that Disney has forged over the last few generations. As I mentioned, there's truth here that's inspiring it. So let's look at some of the reality that is clearly inspiring this comic. And before we talk about Walt Disney, let's talk about Hollywood in general during some of its earlier time and some of the stars that may have gone through some of the similar challenges these tunes did in real life. Probably the most famous example that helped inspire this comic was someone like Judy Garland, who was a star of such iconic movies like Wizard of Oz. And even before Wizard of Oz, Judy Garland was set up to be this American icon, this 
wholesome image of what America tries to be. But as we're talking about, the reality is much darker. By the age of 12, she was put on 24 hour surveillance and everything she ate was strictly monitored. She was put on diet pills and other drugs to keep her at prime performance when they needed her. There was other reports of sexual assault showing that Judy Garland's life was a literal hell. Although Judy Garland was probably the most famous example, by no means was she the only example. Just think about it. If the most famous star, one of the biggest stars can be controlled like this, what does it but say about the others that aren't nearly as prominent? What did they have to go through? How were they controlled? What abuses did they suffer? So yes, although the fact that these tunes we're seeing in Three Fingers are not real, clearly their tales are based on a level of truth. Now the question becomes, well, how does this relate to Walt Disney? Not to crush your childhood dreams, but you know, Mickey Mouse is not real. He is a fictional character. How does this relate? to what he did and what that organization did. Well, despite the fact that Mickey Mouse is not real, the people that drew him were. This brings us to the Disney animation strike of 1941. And you may be asking, well, why did Disney animators strike in 1941? And there's a lot of answers to that question. First answers is how Disney changed bonuses. When Disney was just doing shorts, they had a policy where 20% of their profits were used for employee bonuses. Well, that changed. When did it change? Well, about the time they started getting their most success with feature films like Snow White. Now, to Disney's credit, when Snow White did come out and did have the level of success it did, it did lead them to create new studios. And with these studios came a lot of great luxuries. They had steam rooms and amazing restaurants. Unfortunately, only certain people in the Disney organization had the opportunity to enjoy these luxuries. A lot of regular Disney animators simply were not allowed in. Also, after the box office failures of Pinocchio and Fantasia, yes, those movies were considered box office failures for the time. It led to a lot of layoffs. And not only were there layoffs, but there was also a huge discrepancy in pay at the time for animators. Some animators got $300 a week, where others only got 12 And even one of Disney's best paid animators, Art Babbitt, had issues with the current structure and went to Walt Disney about it and told him how they needed to unionize in order to ensure all of his employees were treated fairly. Well, Walt Disney responded to that request in turn. And I quote, in the 20 years I spent in the business, I've weathered many storms. It's been far from easy sailing. It's required a great deal of work, struggle, determination, competence, faith, and above all, unselfishness. Some people think we have a class distinction in place. They wonder why some people get better seats in the theaters than others. They wonder why some men get spaces in the parking lot and others don't. I've always felt and always will feel that men that contribute most to an organization should, out of respect alone, enjoy some privileges. My first recommendation to a lot of you is this. Put your own house in order. You can't accomplish a damn thing by sitting around and waiting to be told everything. If you're not progressing as you should, instead of grumbling and growling, do something about it. And inspired by Walt Disney's words, they eventually went on strike after Walt Disney fired Art Babbitt, feeling that he personally betrayed Walt Disney. And Walt Disney was not too excited about the fact that 200 of his employees were forming a picket line he got so angry that at one point he physically attacked Art Babbitt. And yes, Walt Disney physically attacked someone for striking. Not something you saw in the Saving Mr. Manx movie, was it? The strike lasted nine weeks, and by the end of it, a salary for a 40-hour work week doubled, and screen credits were established. And that was a great success, but that success had some major costs, as a lot of high-ranking officials in the Disney organization joined in with the animators to sympathize with their plight, including director Arthur Mason Hyman, and he directed the film Fantasia, although you may not know that because due to his actions, Walt Disney fired him and not only fired him, but removed his name from the credits on Fantasia and blacklisted him from the industry as he did many of those that joined in on this plight. Testifying to a house committee, Walt Disney contributed this strike to the rise of communism in the United States. Yes. Walt Disney associated those fighting for workers' rights with communists, which brings us to the question we opened this video with, was Walt Disney a Nazi? And the answer to that question officially is no, although that no is not as strong as you would like to think it is. Prior to World War II, Walt Disney and many of his associates would meet with a German-American bund, also known as the American Nazi Party, and many of their Hollywood personalities. Yes, prior to World War II, there were a number of Nazi Hollywood personalities. Art Babbitt talked about these meetings in the book Hitler's Doubles, and not only did Walt Disney meet with American Nazis, he met with the real thing as well, and some prominent figures in the Nazi party. Walt Disney personally hosted notorious 
Nazi filmmaker Lenny Riefenstahl to promote the film Olympia 1938. You may be asking, well, maybe this was before we knew how bad the Nazis were, and it wasn't. Well, maybe we didn't know about necessarily concentration camps. This meeting occurred a month after the night of broken glass, and, and many at the time even criticized this meeting. To be fair to Walt Disney, though, during World War II, they did make a number of anti-German propaganda films, although rarely did they touch upon the anti-Semitism of the Nazi party, just briefly mentioning things like the master race. Beyond the Nazi connections, you also have allegations of sexism and racism. Now, if you watch a lot of old Disney films, you can see where this comes from. Things like the Crows and Dumbo or the Native Americans in Peter Pan just shine a very negative light on a lot of minorities at the time. And the question is though, was Walt Disney himself racist or was this just a product of the time? What we do know is that during the creation of movies like Song of the South and Snow White that animators and creators of those films reported that Walt Disney was accustomed to using racial slurs including the n-word. So clearly Walt Disney, although maybe a product of his time, I think went to an extreme that I think even at the time was not considered acceptable. What about the sexism? Well, well the sexism was pretty blatant in the fact that in 1938 Mary Ford applied to be an animator and the rejection letter she received said that girls are not considered for creative positions. And this letter was later discovered by her grandson and released online. So the question then becomes, well, why talk about this now? Why talk about this subject when so much of this happened a long time ago? I mean, Walt Disney has long passed away. Am I trying to cancel Walt Disney or whatever juvenile phrase that you want to use for making people accountable for their own actions? No, that's not what I'm necessarily trying to do. Oh, am I telling you, you need to go out and cancel your Disney Plus subscription? No. Walt Disney clearly was a product of his time, and that's kind of the problem. See, Walt Disney, the organization, has done a lot to progress from a lot of these issues. The issue is we can never truly progress unless we talk about what we're progressing from. Important to point out people like Arthur Mason Heimerman and the sacrifices he made when he put his career and livelihood on the line to support these animators in their strike. And he didn't necessarily need to do that. And what was his reward? Well, no good deed goes unpunished. He was blacklisted and never worked again. We often talk about systematic racism, but not how those systems were formed. Things like Walt Disney, one of the biggest organizations on the entire planet, and the racist beliefs that were there from day one, and how people like Walt Disney that are seen in a certain light are not nearly as clean cut as we make them out to be. I think it's important not to idolize individuals as one thing when reality was something very different. Again, do we need to cancel Walt Disney? No, but we need to know who he was as an entire person, not just the image the organization he founded portrays. Lastly, I wanted to bring attention to a comic book I feel deserves a lot of attention, Three Fingers. It's a great book that I would highly advise checking out as it can inspire a conversation like this. And often I feel like, and I'm as guilty as this as anyone, that the conversation around comics can be a bit limited when it really shouldn't be. Comics can inspire you just as much as any artistic medium to rethink the world around you. And that was the case when I read Three Fingers. So hopefully you got something out of this because I feel like I did. So if not, at least, you know, I learned a little bit along the way. But what if you want to check out this book, how can you do so? Well, Three Fingers is kind of hard to find in physical form right now. Maybe you can check it out at your local library or your local bookstore. But outside of that, finding it physically is it's a bit difficult. Luckily, though, it is available on Comixology. Uh, if you have Unlimited as of right now, it's also a free read, too. So double bonus for that. If you read that and you want more, here are some other books I would also recommend. You also have The Fade Out by Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips. And this book, again, talked a lot about early Hollywood. And if you can buy this in issues, highly advise reading it in issues because the back matter included a lot of the, the crazy Hollywood stories I just touched upon in this video. Also check out the comic book history of animation that also talked about the Disney animation strike as well as the history of animation in general. That was recently released in issues this year and the trade should be coming out shortly as well. All right, that's it for me for this week. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. Feel free to leave a comment below about what you thought of it. I would really appreciate that. Just remember, comics are for everyone. The key is finding the right one. Until next time, keep reading.